Okay, so welcome everyone to the November 30th uh, Chaos OSPO Working Group meeting. Um, as a reminder, we are under the Chaos Code of Conduct, so please be kind to each other. We have uh, our question of the day, what fictional world would you most like to live in, which is apparently a popular question because I used this a month ago and didn't remember <laughs> it. So we're just going to we're just going to roll with it and go again. Um, and then I'll, I'll try to find a new list to start picking from in the new year. Because uh, we got some awesome, awesome answers here. Oh, Atlantis. Yeah, that would be interesting. My thoughts are like, basically, where will I not die? It's basically what I'm trying to think of. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, does anybody does anybody object to my rearranging of the um, agenda no. items? No. No. Okay. Um, so just a reminder that the next OSPO meeting is January 11th. So this is the last one before our meeting break. So we break from December 11th through January 8th to give everyone some time to enjoy the holidays and decompress and have fewer meetings uh, when everything else is probably crazy busy. So that's, uh, yeah, so last meeting until January 11th. Um, ChaosCon EU is February 1st. So we've talked about this a few times in this meeting. Registration is open and we do have sponsorships that are still available. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in sponsoring, to let us know. Um, if you're interested in going, go ahead and, and register. So that would be, that would be great. Um, I didn't put it here in the agenda, but I did put it in the Chaos General Slack that the FOSDAM CFPs, in particular, the community dev room closes tomorrow. So this is your final reminder that the community dev room for FOSDAM, the CFP closes tomorrow. So if you've got anything you wanna get in there, um, do it now. Um, it also probably closes tomorrow in a European time zone. So for those of you on the on the West Coast of the US, that's probably before the end of your work day. So keep that in mind as well. State of OpenCon, also CFP closes tomorrow. So again, I put links to both of those in the general Slack channel. Uh, anything else, any any other reminders anybody wants to throw in there? Okay, so I moved, I moved this agenda item to the top because it sounded really interesting. So uh, the repo metrics website demo from digital service at CM, CMS with uh, Isaac and Natalia. So take it away here. Do you want me to, I assume you want me to stop sharing. Let me do that. Oh uh, yeah, I'm going to screen share it a bit. Yep. Here, I will just stop. There you go. It's all, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalia. I'm a U.S. Digital Core Fellow that, um, I'm a Software Engineering Fellow that's under the U.S. Digital Core Fellowship, which is a two-year fellowship where um, early career folks are detailed to work with an agency in the federal government. And um, I am a U.S. Digital Core Fellow that's detailed under um, digital, digital service under CMS. And um, I just started work uh, and I am assigned to work with uh, Remy under the OSPO. And today we'll be talking about one of the first projects that we have started working on. And I'll pass it on to Isaac for an intro. Yeah, thanks, Natalia. Um, I'm also a US Digital Core Fellow uh, working under um, uh, Remy de Cosmaker for the OSPO uh, here at CMS. Um, I previously uh, did a lot of development and uh, maintenance work for Augur here and Chaos. So yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're excited to build up the metrics and OSPO uh, technology here. And then uh, today we'll be presenting an MVP of uh, our first project that we started working on. So um, currently in the DSAC OSPO, uh, we are in the process of performing a inventory on all of the software projects within the uh, Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, GitHub organizations. And we built a tool that will um, assist us with that task. So we created a website that would provide reports on metrics of all of our GitHub repositories, both on an organization level and on a project level. So um, how this works is that we build a website um, that generates JSON files for each repository and group of repositories in our GitHub organization. 
And then we have a GitHub action that calls a Python script that has a uh, clear and definable data set of repositories uh, being called against a uh, data set of metrics. And this is uh, what Isaac built. And then from these JSON files that we generated, we use this to populate a 11T website that's hosted on GitHub. And then I will show you guys a demo of how that looks like. Um, give me a second. Okay. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So here's our homepage where uh, users have access to look at metrics for their GitHub organizations and projects within those organizations. And then for um, our GitHub organization, DSAC MS, this is ours over here. And then it gives us a list of quick stats over here, such as the number of projects under the organization and how many followers we have under that organization. And then from there, we get a detailed report on metrics uh, under that GitHub organization. And I will hand it off to Isaac to talk more about the metrics shown on this page. Yeah, so this is the baseline uh, minimal viable products uh, metrics that we have just to, to get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here we have a summary of like, um, yeah, projects equals repositories. Um, so a repository on either GitHub or GitLab, uh, pretty much exclusively GitHub, just because that's where our projects are. Um, but yeah, this is a report uh, and uh, the just on the basic uh, metrics that you can just get on uh, on the like API and stuff on GitHub. It's comparing the difference uh, in these statistics by week. So that, that's what the uh, diff and percent diff is. It's a difference by week. Um, and based on these statistics, it also generates uh, detailed graphs and stuff. Although this is just the beginning. This is just like our minimum uh, products and that there will be more in the future. Awesome. And then uh, this is how a report would look like on a project level. So very similar. And then we have um, our uh, commits by month graph over here too. Yeah. And that's just meant to be like a spark lines like indicator. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then so um, as you described, that is our minimal viable product. And then um, we have some future things that we hope to add on um, on these reports. Um, Isaac, would you like to talk more about like the auger metrics? Yeah. So um, currently we only really have like the, the simplest uh, metrics implemented for our MVP. But um, next steps uh, include the weekly metrics, uh, weekly time box metrics provided by auger. So like uh, this is just uh, comparing differences in our uh, data collection from week to week, whereas Augur has a much more in-depth like gathered data set that they can query and time box and do all sorts of stuff with. So that that's sort of where um, the next set of uh, metrics is going to come from, along with um, sort of metrics that uh, accurately gauge the activity that's occurring in a project in a repo like uh, top contributors, uh, file complexity, um, mean response time to close a pull request, et cetera. Um, so that's another uh, set of uh, metrics that we aim to get from Augur. Um, and then another thing that we're uh, excited about is um, project categorization metrics. Um, here, I don't, I don't know if I can paste this in the chat. Um, yeah, Nadia labels, quote unquote, which are basically just like um, sort of generally categorizing the size and scope of various repositories and repos um, from things that have a lot of active contributors um, and a lot of active users to things that have not a lot of contributors or users, or maybe a lot of contributors and not a lot of users and sort of just sort of uh, gauging the maturity and substance and nature of a project in that way. So, yeah. Um, we have, yeah, we have a, a, a certainly, um, a breadth of metrics that we're going to add to the site, but yeah, that, that's sort of the, the taste of what we're working on. Yeah. And that is our demo. Thank you, everyone. That's very cool. As, mm -hmm. as was mentioned in the chat, this really came together pretty quickly because we talked about it a few weeks ago um, and it was sounded like it was just getting started. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so it sounds like it came together really quickly. That's great. Uh, any any question. questions? Oh, yeah. sorry, Matt. Yeah, so um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about like 
why you're doing this? Like, who is this for? These dashboards? Um, well, a key uh, motivation is sort of just to show value to sort of uh, certain stakeholders and uh, the government and the broader and open source community broadly. Um, a key metric that the government is concerned with um, from the White House side of things, the OS3I group, is um, just sort of repo security metrics. Uh, um, one very relevant one is the Libyar metric that Augur has, um, which uh, I'm sure most of you know, kind of know what that is. But it's, yeah, it's sort of just like measuring how old libraries are and raising security uh, alerts and stuff if that happens. Um, but yeah. Remy. And yep. And the, one of the main stakeholders for this is the OSPO itself. Uh, we are going to be ramping up our support of open source projects across the ecosystem. And for us to prioritize and figure out how to distribute our limited resources, we need to start with a baseline of data of where our projects are, how far they are along in their journey to open source and what their goals are. And then depending on the goals of those projects, we can give specific insight and say like, oh, okay, you want to go from a one-time release project to something that has contributors. Here's some ways that you can improve your repository hygiene or some of your outreach or some of your other developer positioning so that you can improve that metric. And then also we have existing open source projects that are in that sort of third tier, you know, working in the open and they want to understand how things are going. So providing them with weekly reports to people like product managers and project managers who wanna know like how things are going in the pull request queue or how many new issues were issued or how many contributors are contributing to different projects. Um, those are another key stakeholder. And then the last key stakeholders are our cores, our contracting officer representatives. So those are the folks that are sort of doing the, both accepting of new contractors and the uh, evaluation of existing contractors so that we can go back and have some metrics and some data to say like how our contractors are doing and whether or not they're meeting their goals, uh, whether or not they can show that they demonstrate that they have the ability to meet the goals of future contract uh, requirements and proposals. So those are some of the stakeholders we have in mind, but uh, we also wanna build this in a way that makes it so that other people can fork it. So. OSPO members like you folks, uh, if this stack is useful, uh, we're hoping to build it in such a way where we can just swap out the GitHub URL and your access token and other agencies can use it in their OSPOs or other organizations outside of the government too. Yeah, this is great. I mean, I know this This is always a challenge, right, is is demonstrating the value of your your OSPO and and showing people what what it is that you do. And so this is a really interesting approach to that. Other questions? There was a comment from Justin in the chat. Oh yeah, do you wanna talk about that, Justin, or? Um, it, just to like um, say, hey, if anybody like uh, wants to like um, sh share their um, cutoffs, um, or like a toy uh, club, um, st st stadium, et cetera. Um, I've got some, but they probably like make sense for like um, Microsoft and like I, different people. Um, I um, expect like want to use like um, s s smaller um, at us, um, but uh, like I that had a um, um hypothesis. I like no, I do I test out. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, Rummy, you've got your hand up. I assume you want to respond to that. Yeah, so it would be amazing to talk shop with you about the cutoffs that you have. Um, obviously, like 
there's sort of two different schools around metrics, right? One of them is prescriptive and the other is descriptive. So prescriptive would be us trying to make some kind of hypothesis about where we think the cutoffs are. I think we're going to take more of a descriptive approach and say like, okay, based on all the data that we have in the bell curve, this is what it looks like. And we want to use ratios instead of uh, hard numbers. So we'll say like a club project has, you know, this ratio of contributors to users versus a stadium project, which has a very high ratio of users to contributors and a toy project might have a, you know, a one-to-one -one ratio with a number of contributors less than some amount. Um, we're still working on the exact sort of formulas for that. We have some early ideas and would love to talk more about that with the group. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll make a note to write your email down and talk more after this. Thanks, Justin. Awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, go ahead, Matt. Did you have a question? No, I was just going to point out Justin put his email in the chat, Remy or Natalia. Cool. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, somebody grab that. Um, okay. Next on the agenda, we have the OSPO strategy. Do you do you want to take over so you can share your screen? Or do you want me to just click on these links? Uh, you can just click on them. So <laughs> this is this is me continuing to work on the book chapter. This is the never give up, never surrender. <laughs> no retreat, no surrender, I believe is what no, Mr. It's, Springsteen it's said. Galaxy Quest. Never. Oh, okay. <laughs> Galaxy so, Quest borrowing from Springsteen. <laughs> nonetheless. Um, so really what this is coming down to, so you're all, if you click on the other, just the slide deck, so you're all familiar with this. And I think I've started referring to this kind of as the OSPO playbook, like different ways that OSPOs can think about, um, metrics that might ultimately be helpful in understanding, say how education is going within your organization or how community engagement is going within your organization. And I know that when Emma joins a little bit later maybe in this meeting, like there's a group kind of taking a look at what some of the metrics could be in these particular areas. So that'll be a really helpful exercise as well. So I think this this playbook, you know, we've kind of been working on this for a little while. So the, the chapter, now if you click on the chapter part, is really, it's almost becoming just a narrative against this playbook. Um, so just kind of talking through what each of, each of these sec sections is. And if you recall, over the course of you know many months, I've been asking really pointed questions about how, say, within your organization, you think about the internal adoption or you how you think about education, and you've been really responsive to kind of um, discuss how you how you all approach some of these different quadrants within your organization. Um, the last time we talked about this, if you recall, we were talking about upstream and downstream challenges, which is what you're looking at right there on that page four, Don. I don't know if you remember that conversation. Um, we talked about things like CLA. We talked about license changes in the upstream, just things that an organization needs to take a look at. So those are super helpful. And I'll get these more into narrative form than the notes. So the, the last one that I'm hoping I get a little bit of feedback on is with respect to strategy. And in particular, um, if you go to the minutes now, one of the things that had come up um, pretty consistently is from a strategic, from an OSPO perspective, strategically to ensure that your OSPO is aligned with corporate strategy, making sure that those two are are not differentiating from from each other. So, I guess I'd like to put it out to this group again to kind of um, discuss how you within your OSPO ensure that there is an alignment with uh, corporate strategy, or if that's not the right question, maybe what the right question could be. So I'll just I'll open it up at that point. And I, I, I take notes and minutes if you have thoughts on that, like how you ensure that these are aligned. Or if you don't, then that's okay too. You can say, I don't, we don't care what the company does. <laughs> we do our own thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just said, uh... I, I do think this is a really key question, like, and so just to respond to your second comment, like this does seem like sort of <clears throat> sort of what a lot of the space that I feel like I navigate in is trying to align these two. Um, and 
And I think one of the ways we do that is by talking about what is the um, cost savings and business value of, of engaging, you know, and working with open source communities um, and, and building open source, like, you know, projects. I think there are a lot of challenges with that. One of them is like your ability to have visibility and agency into a corporate strategy when you're like often siloed into, I feel like you can, can get really siloed. Um, uh, so I feel like that's one of the challenges that I, I face. I'm just throwing some ideas out there for people to respond. But I, I do think that this is a, an, an interesting and important question for, for where I kind of feel well, the ASPO. Yeah, uh, Remy, you've got your hand up. I'll try to go fast. So one of the ways you, we in our OSPO current have aligned with strategy is looking at the values and strategic uh, plans for the agency and the department, and then using that language to make sure that our values and our goals and our strategy are explicitly aligned with those. So we created a, in government speak, it's called a functional statement. <clears throat> it sort of describes what your team's mission is and and what it does and we that we directly use the same language and the same goals from the strategy from the for the agency and the department level so that's not necessarily a metric but i think it's an important part of aligning your strategy and then um two quick answers i'll try to go fast in another ospo as a part of in the osas team at red hat it was more of a mature community with lots of, you know, very active open source projects. So those metrics were way more about the contributor funnel, you know, looking at how many users and contributors are going up through the ladder to maintainer or project leader and how many new contributors we're getting was a very important metric that we were tracking, at least in my communities. And then in other OSPOs at larger tech companies, a lot of it was, you know, visibility. So, you know, for better or worse, we all know that optics are, you know, not the best metric, but that was something our stakeholders valued. So tracking those along with things like a talent pipeline, how many folks came from the contributor pipeline and then went into the employee pipeline and became hires. And that was a really important part of our value proposition from the OSPO was the, the people side of it, not just the code. So those are three examples from three OSPOs. Other OSPOs have any examples? I mean, what I Remy said is very similar to what I did uh, when I when I worked at Pivotal and was trying to justify the value of some of the upstream contributions we were making. Uh, we didn't have a formal OSPO, but it was kind of kind of the same thing. But um, it was really along the lines of you know using the same language and making sure that everything everything tied back to something that the company thought was important. Sorry, I talked over somebody. Was that Alyssa? Oh, I was just gonna plus one Remy's point about language. I feel like a really important strategy is using their the corporate language. And I feel like often in, in open source, at least in my role, I feel like I'm translating between like languages constantly, you know, like you're working with different stakeholders. And so I feel like this is like another place where you have to like learn the language of the corporate space that you're in, in order to make, you know, the, the language of, of the open source values. I love that as well. I was just going to say it's also the reverse <laughs> in terms of mm -hmm. trying to ensure that our corporate leaders are using appropriate community oriented language in the right context, because I think it's often I feel like as we we do that conversion internally to try to explain things. But I think it's also kind of on us to educate how others are talking about it that might have less context. Mm -hmm. 
This is really great. Thank you. Um, to, to Alyssa's point, and I think, Sophia, you were touching on it just a little bit there, like the agency that you feel you have in impacting strategy at a corporate level. Alyssa, you had just mentioned like <laughs> having agency in that. Yeah, it's, it's where I feel like this is a space where I'm still trying to figure out and maybe it's very specific to an organization, like what is the agency, but like what are the, the pillars of influence so that you can have agency? I, I, I would be curious to know what people's uh, strategies are. Like one of, um, I'm just throwing some ideas out. One is like, you know, getting co collective, getting internal collective, like, excitement and voice and like, you know, a groundswell up. Another one I think could be like a strategy of getting like um, more press and brand and, you know, re um, uh, reputation influence, you know, like what are the strategies that you might be able to influence like at a, at a, at a higher level? Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure. Oh, it's helpful. Thank you. I think there's also a, a, like an, a brand influence, you know, like open source influence and external like ways that you can influence corporate strategy, not just from an internal like advocacy um, effort. Wait, say that again. So like getting like kind of like press for like your open oh, source gotcha. efforts, I think it influences like, um, also cor corporate strategy. I think hiring as well, like working with the... Anyway, just <laughs> throwing out ideas. Like a retention. Yep. I think Remy kind of alluded to that as well. Just being able to demonstrate that the talent acquisition or the talent pipeline. So cool, thank you. And not just new talent, but professional development as well. Um, whether or not you're senior engineers, a lot of times in the software engineering career ladder to go from say a senior suite to a principal or an architect, a lot of companies require that you can demonstrate that you have influence outside of the company as well. Okay. And open source projects and communities tend to be the best places or one of the best places to demonstrate that leadership. So are your senior engineers performing board duties at large projects or volunteering on conference organizing committee or contributing to papers? You know, those are really important for the for the the upper part of the talent funnel where it's not just getting new talent in the door, but how are we using open source as a tool for professional development and skills development of our, our technical leaders inside the organization. Good, thanks. And Tabitha, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I think I was just gonna add to this, um, as far as just ensuring that there's alignment, I, I, somebody mentioned uh, kind of like a top down and bottom right. up, and I'm thinking of this from ensuring that there are the policies that there they're the policies that you've created as an OSPO or as an organization align with whatever your corporate strategy is. And, and that's a, an obvious place to me to ensure that you are, you are as an OSPO paying attention to those details that matter to your organization's stakeholders. And then on the opposite side of that, on from the bottom up approach is in ensuring that you have uh, at least a, uh, we'll call it a dirt path cleared for your internal uh, contributors for those that do want to contribute upstream uh, and having those documented and aligned with your policies and procedures and other organizational instructions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, thank you. One of the things that I've been doing at Bloomberg as a strategy of alignment, which I think is, you know, there's a big, um, is trying to find the things that are clear corporate priorities, but like maybe not the, the, the direct path. So I've been leaning a lot on like the philanthropy part of what Bloomberg is all, which is a big part of how they identify in terms of the 
the impact in, in uh, like in the in the world. So around green computing and like um, uh, city impact. So I don't I don't know if that's a, a strategy that can scale to other organizations, but sometimes I feel like trying to find the the ones that are clear corporate strategies, but maybe not like the direct path, but like the the indirect ways to get to. Um, uh, for, you know, what, yep. what are the priorities of an organization? Yep, that's helpful. Okay. As always, you're very helpful and <laughs> give me some great ideas. So thank you for this. Did you get what you needed, Matt, or is there? Yeah, no, that was great. I don't worry about that second question at the time being, just in case we have other. I don't want to, if we have that cross OSPO experiment to talk about. I don't think we do because we don't have Emma and we don't have um, Gary. Okay. Okay, well, maybe if I could throw out the AI and open source thing, I would mm -hmm. like to get some feedback. Brian, did you have a comment? I, I will when you're done. I have info and news. Well, that sounds more exciting than what I'm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, no. info and. I, well, it maybe you're gonna tell everybody the same thing, and I'm not gonna steal your thunder. You go. You go. Steal my thunder. I don't care. God's sake. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Work, work, work. Okay, so the reason I'm excited about this is because um, I've been working with this um, with the with the uh, Open Source Institute, our initiative um, around they're trying to craft a definition of what open source AI actually would be um, and how you would define that. And throughout all of 23, <clears throat> they've been going through and doing a lot of workshops around how that definition will look. They have one at Member Summit. Some of you might have hit that. They, um, I helped host one at All Things Open. Um, I've been working with this in conjunction with Ruth Seeley. Um, so she and I have been kind of tag teaming this. She's going to run another workshop at the AI Dev um, Conference out in San Jose um, in a couple of weeks. And then next year, they're gonna take this definition and they're gonna take it out to stakeholders like creators, developers, end users, consumers. So um, for those of you who don't know, um, this is the current draft of, <coughs> hang on, um, where, where should I put it? I guess I'll put it in here. Um, you put it in the somebody chat. Somebody said next year was too late. Well, the definition will be done pretty much early next year, Mark. So, um, they're 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 just basically doing a roadshow and saying here's what it is. But this is the current draft. Um, and what else did I want to show you? Um, there's also, so that's going on. At the same time, there are other initiatives like um, I'm currently working with uh, Red Hat's joining a new foundation called the AI Verify uh, Foundation, um, which supposedly will be um, focusing around like getting, getting qualitative uh, or results out of AI? How do you verify that these results are accurate? Um, this actually, ironically, was originally part of the draft with um, uh, this uh, open AI definition that I showed you. They, were, they, they modeled after the four freedoms, and then they had a fifth one called verify. That um, <coughs> verification has been uh, actually removed from the current draft because in every workshop, nobody figured, nobody could figure out how that would actually work. So the AI Ver Verify Foundation, which is out of Singapore, has started up. There's another organization that's starting here um, in the universe, uh, from UNC and several other organizations that, uh, again, Ruth and I are uh, on the board of. 
called open decision intelligence that is sort of um, trying to figure out what do you do with all of this uh, results from AI. So it's an interesting time um, around this. So that's the information that I wanted to share. Probably the most you know, um, pertinent one is the, the draft because uh, that's the most immediate thing. Are people seeing questions around AI showing up in OSPOs? Does that seem to be a... I, I can, for my part, I'm not seeing a lot of stuff around open AI yet. All of my work around this has been purely voluntary. Um, like, no, like I haven't had customers coming to us and saying, oh, we need to know about open AI. I will say that there are a lot of questions about open data um, and open data governance. And, and so at that level, there's a lot of conversation because they know that AI, this is multi, multi layered. And at the data layer, everybody seems like they're still back there trying to figure out that. Um, yeah. You know, so. At Amazon, the topic is consuming our OSPO, and it's actually spilled out to the entire um, IP lawyer um, team. Um, what's making it complicated is we've mostly gotten very comfortable with with license issues. They're pretty. They're um, it's our regulatory step right now. Internal regulatory step right now is focused on use cases because um, that's kind of where the law is. Ex um, is is um, the 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 um, the IP law about um, about models is is interesting and um, more you learn about less more you learn the less scary it gets, whereas um, compliance and law about the use of these things is the place where we see regulatory action happening and where we're doing our evaluation and approvals. Um, Mark, do you have any links to that regulatory work that you're talking about? Um, I'm going to pick an example right now that should terrify everybody. Um, oh, thank you. In the state of Illinois, in the United States, um, it is a it is a serious statutory tort to have the mere possession of biometrics without informed consent. Um, and no one knows yet whether or not this actually includes things like um, Flickr, Google Photos. Um, the law was written by one of Chicago's illustrious law firms that specialize in trashy um, class action lawsuits. Um, but um, the upshot of it is, is, is that we're starting to realize we need to be really careful about both data storage and training on any part of our infrastructure that happens to be inside Illinois, because all of these, these data sets um, have somewhere something that's, that possibly could look like biometrics. Um, it's, and that, that, that's the law now. Um, places where it's not the law, but we foresee it is, um, where, where, um, or either regulatory or just, or just, um, customer impact is where we're right now being very, very careful about generating content, um, is, um, to pick a, um, I'm going to um, um, scrub a little bit and, and swap some technologies in. Um, the is is a, um, a team has um, asked, could they use a stack of, of um, both um, quote open source AIs and other parts and in other parts of this technology to generate content that show up on Amazon Video? We said uh, absolutely not, not until we understand this better. So it's all the focus is all on use cases and and um, and in, and um, a even tighter definition of internal use than what we're used to so far with open source. Thank you for that. Thanks for sharing. Um, my my questions. Maybe I have a few questions for folks on this call is um, just from an open source like community perspective, are people beginning to see additional noise generated from AI within their communities in terms of like PRs that are coming in to the community that may be AI generated? Or do you have a concern about that? 
Okay, Mark. Yeah, again, so we're seeing we're seeing it show up, um, and doing some of the research. Um, code Copilot Copilot is now ubiquitous in this in the um, startup and pre startup community in the Bay Area, as, as far as we can tell. Um, we are exploring having um, writings and internal policies about about um, about generation, especially since um, we run a generation tool ourselves um, as um, AWS Code Whisperer. And for the most part, it looks is is we're we're informally following following and cribbing, and we'll probably end up writing something that's very sub uh, substantially similar to the one the CNCF wrote about about using generated code and about approving um, approving incoming code. And we hide is is wrong term. We we um, we use a lot the um, the the already existing assumption that um, sometimes in text in a um, in a contributor agreement sometimes just strongly community normed so you have the right to give up you have the right to um, to uh, PR the code that you're contributing um, and it's kind of on you that is the contributor to figure out whether or not your um, generated code um, um, is yours to give or not it's not it's not really the um, the the um, it is not possible for it to be the responsibility responsibility of the um, intaking project to do a provenance review of everything coming in. Right? We've always is it, we we've spent the last twenty years um, skating over the fact you know people could be copy pasting things and and changing it a little bit, and not telling us. Um, well, now people could be generating code, and as we all know, there's all there's a bunch of questions now about should this be tagged. Should be should it um, should there be like like the Apache Foundation is saying where you should put you should put um, a um, a colon footer in your um, in your uh, pull request saying what generator what generator you get it and um, we've gone back and forth on that and decided kind of no in part because it's going to be really hard to explain to a judge how um, how a code generator is any different from the automatic refactorer that's in IntelliJ for someone who doesn't write code they look almost the same. And we haven't required people to tag that. So we see it. Um, we're not really, unofficially speaking here, not really worried about it. Um, we don't go looking for it unless it's a problem. And we're probably going to end up just following the guidelines written by the LFC and CF. They seem, they seem reasonable. Great, thanks. I'm curious, Sophia, question. Yeah. Oh, I'm curious, Sophia, um, if you have anything to add to this based on what some of the big projects that Googlers contribute to. I know there's been some concern within Kubernetes in particular. I'm curious if you have anything you want to talk about. Well, I feel like there's two different approaches. There's the things that we have control over and the things that we don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what the Kubernetes org is choosing to do, and they've been an early user of Copilot. So I think it's one of those things where it's already there. Um, and so at this point, it's more a risk management exercise. What do we really care about? How do we control the things that we do own versus how do we adjust the things that are already happening and ensure that we're reducing risk to our own organization? Um, but at, at this point, it's one of those it would be great if there was better tooling here that doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, say like Providence or your marking or metadata or whatever it is that associates where things are coming from. But that gets really messy because if you generate a script and then edit it, is it really generated anymore or is it mm -hmm. not coming from you? And I think this there's too much gray area, but at the same time, I, I don't know. I, I can't say too much about it because I don't actually know how some of these things are happening because there's so many different pockets of conversation happening in the org. But I'm, I think our team is generally thinking about it from an awareness and a risk management standpoint because it's already there. Um, it's just how much can we know about and how much can we actually control and what do we have to, again, just react to what's happening in other spaces. To, to jump in and pick an and and, and and pick an example of the problem the problem with Providence is is, is these eyes have seen a um, a really skilled developer who took to this very well running VS Code that has plugged into Copilot and into Code Whisperer and into Cody and into a couple of of, co of, of um, automatic refactorizers similar to Google's Croc. Um, it's 
what's generating all that code? Does, um, would he have to do an attribution, a, um, some, um, some sort of providence attribution for every one of those generators? They're just they're just tools. Um, we'll end up we'll end up with um, either source code comments or pull request comments full of noise, giving particular versions of model generating code. Um, one of the concerns that I've I've heard within the Kubernetes community, and I'm not sure how widespread it is, but there's there's concern that um, the low quality AI generated code PRs coming into high profile projects like Kubernetes is can can get a bit overwhelming for for maintainers. It's um, you know people just trying to get some some commits into some of these high profile projects which again just generates additional load on maintainers and and makes it harder for everybody to do what they need to do. I don't know if other people have seen that or heard that. We've we've seen that too and started rejecting some low quality PRs and our our preferred way of doing the rejection now is is not this is low quality go away or this was is you're banging out copilot go away. It's um please, is is for this high profile project please uh, please um your your incoming pull request has to be accompanied um, by same test cases that demonstrate it. Is it's it's discovered if if you're using code prompter and you start by having it write test cases or you write the test cases yourself, it generates hot, much higher quality code, um, and it's a great it's a great soft gate on incoming stuff. Is um, is and you know it's something that we as is is those of the maintain projects have been have been supposed to be doing all these years anyway and kind of soft on it because programmers don't or because we want to bring in we want to bring in newcomers and teach them good practice but it may be time to index harder on that practice um send your prs in with with test cases in, in the in the test suite any other thoughts on that I really recommend everyone play with it. Um, Cody is really easy to start using. Um, um, you will, is if you have it, you'll find out the reason why it's spreading so fast. I'm okay. recommending the competitors' products here. Cody is astounding. I just realized that we we are actually out of time and over time, and this conversation was so interesting. I completely yeah. lost track of time. Uh, does anybody have any? Like quick final last last thoughts on this before we close out and come back in January. What is the link, Cody? What was it? Source graph. Source graph, Cody. Okay. You drop the link in the chat or in the doc. Yes, the doc could be better. Not right now because we're about to quit. But um, I wouldn't mind getting a little bit of a scope on this because, you know, Mark and I are kind of talking about different things at this point which is fine. I just didn't like, I don't know, maybe we should narrow what we were going to talk about or, um, you know, or figure that out. Yeah, there, there are kind of two things. There's AIs generating open source software and are there AIs that we can call open source? They're really right. different topics. Exactly. So, you know, I obviously I interpreted what was close to me, you interpreted what was close to you. You have to head and think about both, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the group, yeah. I think, Matt, you put this on the agenda. Um, do you want to? Yeah. Well, come on, Matt. What do you want to do? <laughs> yeah. It was really towards the latter is what I was kind of kind of focusing on. At least that's where my mind was when I put it on the agenda. But that doesn't preclude what you were talking about either, Brian. That's fine. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everybody. This was a really, really interesting meeting. We had uh, we had a good demo to start it off. We had some interesting discussions, um, and I hope everybody enjoys their little little chaos meeting break and has a good time over the holidays. And we'll see you back in this meeting in January. Thanks everybody. In January. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye.